Okay, this is problem 9-145, it's on page 548. Consider an aircraft powered by a turbojet engine that has a pressure ratio of 9. The aircraft is stationary on the ground held in position by its brakes. The ambient air is at 7 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, let's see, and 95 kilopascals. Uh, it enters the engine at a rate of 20 kilograms per second. The jet fuel has a heating value of 42,700 kilojoules per kilogram and it is burned completely at a rate of one half kilogram per second. Neglecting the effect of the diffuser and disregarding the slight increase in mass at the engine exit, as well as the inefficiencies of engine components, determine the force that must be applied on the brakes to hold the plane stationary. All right, let's jot down what we're doing and try to understand what they're telling us. The pressure ratio, I'll call it R sub P, is 9. Remember, what other cycle had a pressure ratio with it? The Brayton cycle. In fact, remember the jet engine cycle is closely related to the Brayton cycle. You have to be careful about this, though, because sometimes they'll give you the pressure ratio across the entire cycle, from state 1 all the way up to state 3, or they'll give you the pressure ratio across just the turbine or just the compressor. So you have to be careful about it. Now, they told us to uh, neglect the diffuser. What does that do to the cycle? Bring it back up. I'm on the screen so we can look at it. Should we close the presentation quite so quickly? Let's see, jet engine cycle. Here we go. Let's just look at the cycle diagram. Okay, so if we neglect the diffuser, what does that do to this? You know what? I ought to just draw it over here. Let's draw the TS diagram. It's easy enough to draw. So one, three, four, five, and six. Why didn't I draw state two? Well, if we're neglecting the diffuser, then state one is state two. Right? So this is state one, comma state two down here. Okay. So if they gave us a pressure ratio, it really wouldn't matter if it's across the compressor or the whole system. It's the same thing with the state one and state two. They told us the pressure uh, coming into the diffuser. What was that pressure? 95 kilopascals. What state would that come in at? Uh, one. State one, that's right. So P1 is 95 kilopascals. With a pressure ratio of nine, what does that mean the pressure at states three and four would be? Nine times that. Right, so you can calculate it. Um, in fact, we'll do that uh, a little later, I think. It doesn't matter right now. They gave us a flow rate of 20 kilograms per second. What was that? What was the flow rate of what? The air. The air, so the working flow. So that would be an M dot. 20 kilograms per second. Is that a lot of air? Per second, yes. Yeah, I mean, how much does a person weigh about? How much is a person's mass in kilograms of that? 80, 70, somewhere in that range. So 20, let's say it's 80, 20 kilograms, this is a fourth of a person every second going through the engine in air's mass. That's a lot of air. Okay, now people have gone through jet engines. It just doesn't work very well. Okay, it's a bad idea, don't try it. Okay, you don't want to get sucked in the front of the engine, it's not fun. Okay. So anyway, they gave us another mass flow rate, though. They, they gave us this half kilogram per second. Well, that was the mass flow rate of the fuel. Okay. And they told us to neglect the little bit of extra mass that adds coming out of the, uh, the nozzle. And okay, we're going through the turbine and the nozzle. So we're going to assume that the mass flow rate through the whole thing is, is just 20 kilograms per second. If we neglect the diffuser, what else does that do? Let's look at the math behind the cycle and the slides. We had a few equations that dealt with the nozzle and the diffuser. What does that mean? Well, if we neglect the effect of the diffuser, state one and state two is the same thing. Well, that means the kinetic energy of state one and state two would be the same also. Okay. So we know 
that moving from state one to state two, a lot of times once you have to do to solve these problems, you just walk around the entire cycle diagram. Hopefully you're getting that idea by now. To move from state one to state two is easy. V1 is V2, and H1 is H2, and so T1 is T2. That was easy. Right? They're the same state. Okay. To move from state two to state three, what do we need to do? How are states two and three related? Isentropically, right? So couldn't we use an isentropic equation like this? T3 over T2 equals P3 over P2 to the power of K minus one quantity over K, right? And so basically what that means is T3 is T2. P3 over P2, that's just the pressure ratio, right? So just the pressure ratio to the K minus one over K. Now, what value should we use here? Well, T2, uh, do we know T2? Well, let's see, they told us that T1 is uh, 280 Kelvin. Now, there's a lot of times we want to just work in Kelvin because we end up with things like this where we have to have absolute temperatures anyway. So T2 is the same thing as T1. So this is 280 Kelvin pressure ratio 9. K for air is 1.4. That's one of the things you probably want to memorize. So 0 0.4 over 1.4, I just took the difference in my head, that was easy. Okay. So we got T3. So T3 then comes out to 524.56 Kelvin. Notice there's no isentropic efficiency to worry about here because they told us this is all ideal. Okay. Why would you analyze something like that? If you wanted, Let's say you really needed to size a break for an aircraft. Would you analyze it this way? Or would you include the isentropic efficiencies or inefficiencies of the engine? You want the max. Right? You want the max. I'd do it this way, right? Because this is the worst case scenario. And then you right. double it because you're the government. <laughs> you can afford no, to you do multiply it. by 20. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not necessarily the government, you're Boeing or someone. Right? Oh, well, so, you've got a government contract. Keep okay, okay. <laughs> Milking for all their work. So there's how we solve state three, essentially, right? Getting the temperatures is essentially solving the state. So let's just move on, three to four. Okay. So how do we go from three to four? Well, what's going on from state three to four? Well, this is the burner section. This is where we're adding heat. This is where QN occurs. Do we know how quickly heat's being added? We have an idea of the fuel flow rate. We assume that it's burned completely. And by the way, the heating value of the fuel was given and was what? Uh, 42,700 kilojoules per kilogram. Couldn't we say that QN, the flow rate, is the mass flow rate of the fuel multiplied by the heating value? Right? Because look, if you burn a kilogram of the jet fuel, you get 42,700 kilojoules. Oh, by the way, we're burning a half kilogram per second. So we're getting a half of this many kilojoules per second. Right? That's Q dot M. So when you plug all that in, the half of the heating value numerically comes out to 21,350 kilojoules per second or kilowatts. It's interesting to convert that to horsepower. Okay? It's a lot of horsepower. Okay? Now, what does that heat do? Well, it changes the enthalpy of the air. So this is also equal to the mass flow rate of the air. I'm going to put an A here. Well, maybe not. I didn't use an A over here, so hopefully you'll know that that's for the air. That's equal to the mass flow rate of the air times the enthalpy change of the air to the burner, right? Because all this heat from the fuel goes into heating up the air. That's its job. So do you see how this gives us the enthalpy in state four? We know the rate of heat addition. We know the mass flow rate of the air. We could look up the enthalpy in state three pretty easily, or we could do something like this, equals m dot cp t4 minus t3. Solve for t4. You see how that's a known now? Right, because t3 is a known, heat capacity of air is easy, mass flow rate of air is easy. And so we can find the temperature in state four. I'll write it out for you for the sake of the video. T4 is q dot n divided by the mass flow rate of air times heat capacity of the air plus T3. I won't plug in all the numbers, but at least there's the, the uh, way we would do it. And so the temperature in state four comes out to about 
86.8 Kelvin, which is nice and warm. If it were the temperature outside, we'd be dead. <laughs> we wouldn't be here. Okay? It's hot. So we've moved from state one all the way to state four. Now let's go from state four to state five. Let's see if we can do that. All we're doing is walking around the cycle diagram. Four to five. What, what, what's important about this? What, what is that four to five? What's that thing? Isotropic. Isotropic. That's the process. Where is it occurring? In the turbine. Okay. What do we know about the turbine's work? It's equal to the compressor. Equal to the compressor work, right? And so what did that mean? Well, if the specific work produced by the turbine is completely consumed by the compressor, at least approximately, then that means the enthalpy in state 3 minus the enthalpy in state 2, what's that? Well, that's the enthalpy rise in the compressor, is equal to the enthalpy drop, H4 minus H5, in the turbine, right? And what that meant is that the temperature in state 3 minus the temperature, whoops, temperature in state 2 is equal to the temperature in state 4 minus the temperature in state 5. Remember that equation I told you to write down? This is why we need it. Okay. So we can get the temperature in state 5. It's just temperature in state 4 minus T3 plus T2. Just rearranging the equation. You can see we've already got T4, we've got T3, we've got T2. It's the same thing as T1. So when you plug in all those numbers, you'll find the temperature in state 5. I'm going to pull a line off here else out. Anyway, the temperature in state 5 comes out to 1342.2 and that's Kelvin. It's on the same axis, so we should be okay. Right. We've solved all the way to state 5. What about going from 5 to 6? That's the last move we need to make. State 5 to state 6. How does that go? How are they related? Isotropically. So we can do this. I'll do it quickly. T6 over T4. Wait a second. Couldn't we go T5 to T4 or to T6? We could. The only problem is we don't know that pressure ratio. I'm going to relate this to the pressure ratio P6 over P4. This is kind of a trick, right? I don't know the pressure at state 5. I could figure it out. I know the temperature at state 5. I don't want to. What I'm going to do is just go from 4 directly to 6. Okay? So anyway, there's of course a little more that goes with this. And notice that this, P6 over P4, is just 1 over the pressure ratio. Okay? So that's just 1 over RP. This allows us to solve for T6. You guys can see it's just rearranged, but we've got all this other stuff. So the temperature in state 6 comes out to about 847 Kelvin. It's a point zero. Now that we've got all the temperatures, the problem solved. Well, not really. They asked us for some things. They asked us to determine the, um, the force that has to be applied. So what do we need? Well, we need the thrust. How do we calculate thrust? Well, we need to know how much the air changes its velocity. Okay. Well, the air in front of the engine is sitting still, right? It's not moving. The, en the engine's pulling it in. So basically that air goes from zero speed up to the speed coming out. What is the speed coming out? So we solved everything. Well, almost. We can also use going from 5 to 6, an energy balance to say H5 plus V5 squared over 2, notice that's the kinetic energy coming into the nozzle, equals H6 plus V6 squared over 2. And we're going to neglect the kinetic energy coming into the nozzle, of course. We can then solve for the velocity coming out of state 6 as root 2 H5 minus H6, of course, we're going to approximate that as Cp delta T for the enthalpy change. Okay. Since we're working in temperatures anyway, we know all the temperatures 
and I want to make sure you're familiar, familiar with this, 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram per kelvin is the heat capacity of the air, okay, at constant pressure. T5 and T6 we know, 1342.2, minus T6, 847.0, and that's kelvin. Kelvins go away, but now we have a velocity in square root of kilojoules per kilogram. What do we do to fix that? We'd like meters per second. Kilojoules per meter per second. That's right. So we need to multiply by 1,000 meters squared per second squared for each one kilojoule per kilogram. Remember that? Sorry if it's off the video, but we need a conversion factor. You need to highlight that conversion factor if you haven't already. Okay? So that will take care of the kilojoules per kilogram and give us a nice blistering exit speed of 997.7 meters per second. You do that down the road and the cops won't catch you. Of course, you probably won't be here tomorrow. They'll run into something. Okay? Yeah, a gas station is what you'll need. <laughs> you'll need a gas station. You won't be able to slow it down for it, though, because your brakes will be melted. Okay? All right. Okay, so let's finish this thing off. The thrust is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by the velocity. In other words, if we know how quickly we're accelerating, by the way, this would be V6 minus V1, really, but we said V1 is zero, okay, because the air coming into the engine essentially has no velocity. Okay. So the mass flow rate, 20 kilograms per second, multiplied by 997.5. 7 meters per second. What units will we get out here? A kilogram meter per second squared, really. I guess we have to put it all together. What is that? Newtons, right? Kilogram meter per second is a newton. Now, when you plug this in, you get a pretty large number, so I wrote it down in kilonewtons. I took the number I got there and divided by 1,000. It's about 20,000 newtons of thrust. It's also impressive to convert that into pounds. Okay? And that's what they asked us to find. The answer they got was 19.39 newtons. Any idea why there might be a difference? Typical answer is rounding. What's that? Typical answer is rounding. Could be rounding. I'm not sure. I, I need to solve this also using the uh, uh, not constant heat capacity isentropic equations. I think that's the difference if I remember right. All right.